get now to one of the more contentious issues, and it is whether or not it's offensive to be asked to pledge allegiance to King Charles. You'd have thought that they were trying to make us put a gun to our heads and make us do it, but no, still people are offended by it, apparently. There is going to be an oath of allegiance for the public to voluntarily take part in during Saturday's ceremony, and it is absolutely going to go ahead. It's called the homage of the people, and it's fair to say it's not gone down that well with everybody because our one pressure group, who want the monarchy to be abolished, have been saying that it's actually offensive. So, there we go. They also say that it's tone deaf. But GB News presenter Nana Raquia joined me a little bit earlier on to say exactly why she quite likes the idea. I mean, you would think that the noise that you're hearing about it, that it's some evil deed that you've been asked to perform and that we were some communist country forcing people to do it. I mean, it is, as you said, a bit like a national anthem, really, I think. And it's not like taking the knee, like an empty virtue signal that's a fad. It's just something that you can do personally to show your relationship with the monarch. I mean, it's like a two-way thing, isn't it? I, I want Britain. I love Britain. I think it's a fantastic country. I'm doing it because, you know, my, my parents obviously were immigrants. They came here through safe and legal routes. And they are very grateful and love this country. I was born here. And I think a lot of the time, uh, these the sort of people that don't want to do it haven't really gone out and had, had a look at other countries. I mean, if you go places like Africa, I mean, they would love to have the kind of environment and the kind of civilization that we live in. I know there are beautiful parts of Africa and it's lovely, but there are, you know, they've got different elements there where this country is, is quite even, it's very level, and it's a, a pretty safe country. So I'm thankful to be here. I'm thankful I was born here. And I love it with all my heart. And anything that keeps it stable, like the monarchy, I'm happy to pledge allegiance to. But I believe it's a two-way street as well. Well, absolutely. So there we go. Look, now, I think this is just a minor little oath of allegiance. Why would anyone particularly get on their high horse about it? So that was Nana's view there. But let's find out if the former Labour MP... Dennis McShane will do the same. This is a chap who I've got no doubt would have no problem whatsoever pledging allegiance to the European Union flag, probably the Ukrainian flag as well. But when it comes to our own king, I'm not sure where you stand, Dennis. Talk to me. Very simply, I, I, unlike Nana, I'm, unlike uh, most of your listeners, I've already sworn, or you affirm, this particular oath in the House of Commons because when you're elected, and I think I've been there five times, you have to go in, the clerk hands you the little uh, card, you read it out, you sign the book, so you're an MP, and then you start getting paid again. So you'd be pretty blooming stupid not to affirm or swear it. I just found it rather odd, the splash on the Sunday Times Sunday, that the church was demanding people to do this. I don't think the Anglican Church has handled its role in the coronation that well. Uh, no other European monarchy has a coronation. And yes, I think in all other European countries, the king or the queen, when she succeeds, goes to the parliament and swears to protect the constitution and the interests of the people. I think maybe King Charles should do that to us. Well, it is very much a two-way street, isn't it? As Nana was alluding to there, saying that we pledge allegiance to the king, but she also, the king, sorry, also pledges allegiance to us, really. Dennis, do you think that anyone who doesn't want to do it is actually just some kind of Republican snowflake who should cheer up a little bit and stop trying to fill what is a happy day in the British national calendar with unrelenting misery? Oh, I don't think so. I'm not that keen, because you actually affirm or swear the oath to support his uh, possible heirs. Now, one possible heir, eight in line to the throne, is Prince Andrew, Patrick, you really want to get on your knees and swear an oath of allegiance to Prince Andrew? Good luck to you. I don't think I'll be joining you on that one. No, but uh, I do wonder whether or not a lot of people now who are being offended by this are not really understanding that this is just a choice that you, have, you can make. And I think realistically it is just quite a nice, good, solid British thing to do. And if they don't like it, maybe they can go and live somewhere else. 
Well, I always find the line, you go and live somewhere else, and I've had heard it, you know, all my life from all sorts of different political quarters, is a bit daft. Uh, I was only a baby at the last coronation. I don't know if my uh, uh, Irish-Scottish mother or my immigrant father held me up and said, he's swearing an oath, Your Majesty, to you. He can't quite talk yet, but he'll do it in his nappy. So I just think we'll see what happens. Is the whole country going to come to a dead stop on Saturday? Do we know the time? and we're meant to do this? Can we send it in by email? Does the king reply to us? Uh, I just think, frankly, as you say, we'll have a nice day, I hope, good weather, we hope, pageantry, all the things we love, colour, and then on Monday morning we'll wake up to the reality of the Britain he is now monarch of. This, of course, will be his first appearance since the publication, the release of his... Uh, mm. OK, Dennis, I also want to get you on one of the other big topics for us of the day, which is not just the oath of allegiance to... Our king, which I know that many people will indeed be taking. It's just a nice symbol, I think, of national unity and history. A lot of people, Dennis, are getting very up in arms about the potential cost of the coronation. They are saying that in the round it will come to around £250 million. The actual cost of the coronation itself is believed to be a kind of nice round £100 million, but then you've got to add all security costs onto it, etc, etc, etc. But the benefit to our economy is rumoured to be around a billion quid. Where are you on this, Dennis? Do you think financially the coronation is worth it? Well, the Centre for European for Economic and Business Research is the only serious body that produced a, a very good report uh, yesterday, uh, I think. It's not quite that much. They also say that having all these extra bank holidays is very bad for the economy because we just stop working, we stop producing, we stop adding value. It, it, it's an, uh, look, the Bastille Day celebrations in France on the 14th of July always look spectacular, always look expensive, uh, and I don't think the French begrudge spending tax payers' money on, on that. We, we like the pageantry. We like the guards marching up and down, the colour and all the, all the rest of it. Uh, but, um, yeah, I was I was hopeful that King Charles would start a new era. He is unbelievably wealthy. He's got more palaces than the kings of France in the 18th century before they had their heads chopped off. Maybe he could start and really think what kind of a modern monarch he wants to be. I just wonder, Dennis, uh, about taxpayers in, in all of this. I imagine you often do as well. But whether or not taxpayers would much rather our money go to something like a coronation than a variety of other different things that we seem to be splurging it on willy-nilly at the moment. I dare say if you went round and surveyed every taxpayer, they'd be perfectly happy for their money to go on a big coronation. They might, but you look at the record levels of food banks, of people starving, of not eating if they want to put on their heating, and you look uh, at King Charles, not his fault, he's inherited all of this, but he didn't earn it. It belongs to the people, in my view. I mean, the head of state is part of how we run the country. It's not his private income. He's not Rishi Sunak, you know, a multi-billionaire of Donald Trump. And I would have thought that maybe... Uh, the palace donating you know, free food on Saturday to the people who are so hungry in Britain, that would be a warm and wonderful way of celebrating the coronation. But I'm not blaming him because he, he's very, very traditional uh, and he's waited now you know, nearly eight decades for this moment in his life. Um, we wish him well. You know, it's, it's a hard job he's got. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, I wish he could have been a bit more original, a bit more innovative, instead of just the same old, same old. Well, I think a lot of people might be saying, Dennis, this is tradition, and it is a fantastic continuation of, of tradition. And actually, what King Charles does for our economy, just day to day anyway, with tourism, these people behind me here are all flocking to see the palace. And it's like this on a normal day, actually, to be honest with you, with a load of tourists coming here. But also, as well, the charity work that they do, the ambassadorial roles that they do. And as well, Charles did donate quite a lot of money during the cost of living crisis to a variety of different causes. So I, I wonder whether the idea that Charles is tone deaf to the uh, personal plight of a lot of people financially at the moment is, is, not, is not quite accurate, really, Dennis. 
Well, I, I look, I'm, I'm not going to in, 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 insult him. He's a serious guy. I've, I've, I've met him. I've even skied with him. Uh, so you know, I'm not a personal friend or anything, but no particular uh, problem. But I, I, I do think, I mean, if you want the most visited royal palace in Europe, it's in Republican France, Versailles. Uh, everybody goes there because Buckingham Palace is closed. And I think it, the balcony should be opened up and everybody should go on it and have their selfie or their photo taken on the balcony of Buckingham Palace. He's got at least four giant palaces, no other monarch in Europe in the world. I don't think even Donald Trump has more than you know two, two or three big homes. And I just would have, as I say, wished for a little bit more reflection. You say it's a long tradition. Well, I mean, if it happens just once every 70 or 80 years. That's another problem. He, uh, I hope he has a long life. He's a longer life as the Queen and Prince Philip. He'll be there uh, so long that Prince William will have to wait until he is 65 before he becomes king. And if he has a good life, then Prince George has to wait into his 60s. So the whole of this century, we're going to have these rather ageing men, not the wonderful, glorious example of that young queen who wore the uniform of the army during the war and was just a stunning success globally. Just an old man, then another old man, then another old man tramping along. Uh, And I really think they ought to take this moment, not, not before Saturday, that's silly, just enjoy Saturday, and really rethink what in the 21st century, uh, a 19th century type monarch, uh, which Charles seems to want to continue being, uh, should be doing. I mean, Dennis, I, I, look, I, I, I do enjoy our chats, Dennis. I do enjoy our chats, but good grief, you are miserable sometimes. You know, you said, oh, let's just enjoy it. You wanted to turn Buckingham Palace into a tourist centre. I mean, that would be... People People would be going around it, staying, for want of a better phrase, Dennis, at His Majesty's pleasure, which, of course, we could never possibly have, could we? And then, of course, we have now people lining the streets, and then you want us to immediately have a conversation about whether or not we change the monarchy. Dennis, that's quite enough. I'll see you next time. Dennis McShane there, of course, former Minister Fantastic stuff. Right, okay.